right, so today we're going to be talking about MSK procedures. This is a lecture for clinical clerkship, and this is Prof G. Uh, we're going to be talking about some reductions, some joint injections, and some other procedures, aspirations, and such. Here are your instructional objectives, as always. And here's our lecture outline. So what we'll do is we'll start with the upper extremity. Uh, first, we'll talk about two different uh, types of reductions, the shoulder reduction and a nursemaid's elbow reduction. Then we'll move on to uh, some other injections and aspirations of the upper extremity. And then we'll move on to the lower extremity. We'll do um, the injections and aspirations there, and we'll wrap up with trigger point injections. Now, with procedures, I'll say this up front, Teaching clinical clerkship lecture is really challenging. It's, it's kind of like teaching anatomy because it's a lot of memorization and it's a little different from anatomy in that it is very hands-on. Everything that you're doing, studying and reviewing is something that you're going to actually be doing with your own hands when you're out practicing. And so it is a little challenging uh, to teach it without just reading step by step what's going on. So I'm going to try my best, but you will have to meet me halfway because when you are studying for this, you're going to have to commit quite a few things to memory. Um, the information is really important to know before going into procedure. As you know with clerkship, uh, many times when we are learning how to do procedures for the first time, it is the see one, do one, teach one mentality. And sometimes we don't get to see one. Sometimes we just learn about it and we go and we do one with the help of our preceptors uh, but or, or the help of YouTube if we've forgotten, if it's been a while since we've done, uh, since we've been in school. So what I'd like for us to do is recall some of our anatomy. Now recall that I taught y'all the lower limb anatomy. So hopefully that's nice and fresh. Uh, in your mind so that these procedures will be a little bit easier to understand and to know where you're going and why the technique that we're using is why we why we use that technique. One thing that I'll say up front for any procedure that you're doing is uh, informing the patient is key, patient or the patient's parents. Uh, because once you get in the middle of a procedure, sometimes things can get a little bit chaotic, a kind of controlled chaos and you know what you're doing but the parents or the, the patients don't always know what's going on as we're doing step by step sometimes procedures can be painful so my best advice to you that i've learned over my almost 15 years of practice is to be very descriptive and inform your patients and your parents and if it is a procedure that you're going to be doing on a child um, i always try to make my description of the procedure as realistic as possible and the reason for that is that if I describe, let's say, a laceration repair as the kid's not going to like it, we're going to swaddle them, wrap them up like a mummy, keep them as still as possible, we're going to place numbing medication, which does burn, but after that, the area will be numb, but more than likely, the child's not going to be happy with us. They're probably going to kick, scream, cry the entire procedure. And if I prepare the parents for that, and then I start the procedure, they do, they cry a bit for the numbing and then they get to the major procedure and they fall asleep or they chill, then I look like a rock star. But if the opposite, if I tell them it's not going to be so bad, you know, they're going to have numbing medicine, they won't feel anything, and then the kid's screaming and crying the whole time, the parent's going to think either one, I don't know what I'm doing, or two, I'm, you know, hurting their child, which is something that I certainly don't want to have happen. So anyways, it's just a, a few pearls of advice just to be really good about describing your procedures to your patients. Uh, when you're studying, uh, I'd like you to kind of take the same approach to every procedure. Now, this lecture is literally, I wouldn't say exactly copied and pasted, but most of the, all the information comes directly from your textbook. The textbook's very easy to read. I don't know how many of you have actually opened the textbook, but uh, for clinical clerkship, the textbook's really easy to read and to memorize. So I just essentially took all that information and placed it in a PowerPoint for you. But when you're studying, I'd like you to approach each procedure the same way. You should start with the indications, why we do the procedures, then move on to why we shouldn't do them, uh, any complications that can happen, and then lastly, patient care instructions. Um, 
then the meat of everything is going to be the step-by-step -step of each procedure, paying attention to what kind of needles you're using, uh, what angle of the needles you're using, what are your landmarks anatomically. And uh, also in your books, you'll have some pearls and pitfalls and knowing differences between absolute and relative contraindications. So without um, talking your ear off uh, more, let's go ahead and move on to the upper extremity. And we will start with something that a lot of us are probably familiar with, shoulder dislocations. So as you can see here, this shoulder does not look normal. We have this kind of step off here. And that's because they, we have a uh, humeral head, a shoulder dislocation. Uh, so let's talk about shoulder dislocations a little bit. And then we need to talk about the many different techniques that we have to reducing a shoulder. Now, here we see one technique. Uh, I call this the barbaric technique. <laughs> uh, I certainly wouldn't recommend it. We have a lot more... Um, ways and uh, methods uh, that are much more humane than sticking your foot in someone's armpit and yanking on it. So let's go through that. Here I have some hyperlinks for your YouTube videos on certain reductions that I like and I also think have them embedded a little later on in our presentation. So essentially we have two major types of shoulder dislocation and one is way way more common than the other but we should still be familiar with both. Uh, now, I'll give you a second, which is more common, anterior or posterior dislocations? Yeah, you're right. Anterior dislocations are much more common. About 95% of shoulder dislocations are, in fact, anterior shoulder dislocations. Um, essentially, what happens is the head of the humerus, which fits in the glenoid fossa, gets dis disassociated with that articulation, so can either dislocate the humeral head can either dislocate, anterior, dislocate anteriorly or posteriorly and as you can see here this is an anterior dislocation which is much more common posterior is much more difficult okay uh, usually patients present with this you know pain uh, usually a traumatic event and and then once it's dislocated they have a pretty significant restriction of movement of the shoulder um, and a lot of patients that have a dislocation once tend to have it again. Um, so we set, we see it um, mostly in young males, okay, nine to one male to female ratio. And we also see it in older females, okay. Um, like we mentioned before, only, you know, 95% anterior dislocation, only about two to four percent are posterior. I don't know what the other, you know, two percent are or whatever, but. Um, a lot of times in vignettes when we see uh, posterior shoulder dislocations we see things uh, like seizures or um, you know f uh, significant trauma okay but mo what I see more often is seizures and uh, some uh, x-ray reading tips here you can see a normal shoulder x-ray you can see the humeral head in the glenoid fossa right there uh, this one, it's sometimes kind of hard to tell whether it's anterior or posterior. This one is an anterior shoulder dislocation. looks really similar to this. For posterior shoulder dislocations, we have a few signs. I wouldn't expect you to read it on an x-ray, but you would. I would expect you to recognize these signs in a vignette that would help trigger you to think it is a posterior shoulder dislocation. Uh, and they are the tro sign, which is a dense line that forms. Um, in the humeral head due to the impaction of it. Uh, then we have the rim sign, which is this widened joint and greater than six millimeters. And we have the light bulb sign because it literally looks like a little light bulb. Okay. All right. So there are a lot of different techniques for reducing shoulder. And the majority of them are for anterior shoulder dislocations because they are way more common. And we do, we are going to talk about at least one method for reducing posterior shoulder dislocation. Um, there are way more, I just want you to know, way more techniques than I'm going to show you. And there's actually some videos in this presentation that kind of show that. But we're going to hit the ones that I think are the most important for you to, to be familiar with. So ways to reduce a joint any joint successfully are going to be knowledge of the anatomy how does the anatomy work what's holding things in place where are things fitting um, knowing how to do certain techniques and being good at them which 
takes practice. And then uh, using adequate procedural sedation is very important. So it, I don't know if any of y'all have ever had a shoulder uh, dislocation or have seen someone with it, but it can be quite painful and uncomfortable. And what happens when our body is experiencing a discomfort is those muscles kind of clamp down, lock down, and it makes it really, really difficult to relax those muscles enough for that joint to pop back in place. Uh, and then just approaching the reduction calmly and gently, knowing that you can't force that joint back together. Other key points, uh, for any time you do a reduction of a joint, you're going to want to do a pre and post reduction neurologic neurovascular assessment, checking pulses, sensation, uh, capillary refill, etc. Uh, you're also going to want to get pre and post reduction radiographs. And of course, once you get the joint back where it belongs, you want to immobilize it and have them follow up. Uh, anytime you get a dislocation of a joint, all those ligaments that are intended to keep that joint intact and stable get stretched and sometimes torn. So we can have the tendency for instability of the joint, hence the need for immobilization and follow up. Uh, if there's a fracture, uh, if there's a prosthetic or anything that's uh, kind of above your pay grade, Make sure that you get an orthopedic consultation. Uh, also, if there's a neurovascular impairment, uh, do not attempt to reduce these. Uh, get, get the ortho on board. And last but not least, PDs. Pediatric cases they should always have orthopedic involved. Now, if you're the orthopedic PA, then you're the, you're the man or woman in charge, and we will default to your recommendations. And that's, of course, because there's growth plates involved. We don't want to mess with the growth plates. That can cause um, some significant long-term morbidity. All right, so why do we need to do shoulder reductions? I always think these indications are kind of silly, right? I mean, because you have a dislocated joint, so we got to reduce it, right? Um, so that's pretty easy. We, got, we can check that one off our study list. Um, contraindications, why shouldn't we do this? Well. We are going to try our best. If it's within our scope of practice, we can try. We have two, two attempts or two um, shots at getting things back into place. After those two attempts, we, we should start thinking about there's probably some sort of ligament, something that's impeding that joint because shoulders should, should pop back in pretty easily. Um, if you have a neurovascular, neurovascular, your patient is not intact, or something, or you have two failed attempts, or a fractures present like we talked about, uh, ortho should be involved in all of those cases. Um, one thing I wanted to mention about the two failed attempts, so it reminds me of, I used to work in the emergency room in Dallas, and we had a really big freeze. And whenever there's a freeze, we have an influx of patients with broken limbs because of slips, trips, and falls. And we had a gentleman that came in with a, an ankle dislocation. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen an ankle dislocation, but it is funky looking and very discomfort, very uncomfortable for the patient. So we gave him um, some sedation and we, uh, myself and my attending, tried to get this ankle back in place and we just could not get it back in. We, we would get it, you know, kind of pull on it, get it back where it needed to be. And as soon as we let it go, it would just roomp like jerk right back out of a place and uh, you know we tried a couple times we could not get it back and it, it ends up that there was a, a tendon that, that the bone was getting caught on and it, it just could get around that tendon to get back in place and so it just kept kind of slingshotting back out so again two failed attempts that's it get the ortho get ortho involved okay complications what can happen well Recurrent dislocation, like we talked about, you got laxity in the ligaments, and that can be, uh, you know, potentially uh, a cause for future dislocations, which we should mention to our patients. Uh, of course, whenever we're putting a bone back in its socket, we can inadvertently damage um, va vascular structures, arteries, veins, uh, and nerves. Uh, although we try to use proper technique as so to not injure them. Uh, you can break bones, you can chip bones, uh, you can also cause uh, injuries to the short rotator cuff muscles. Post-procedure instructions, which we tell a patient after we're done, 
well, we're going to keep the shoulder immobilized uh, either with uh, a sling or a sling and swath immobilizer. Uh, of course, like we mentioned before, we're going to reassess circulatory status. You can tell patients what to look for at home to look for, you know, um, increased swelling and uh, numbness, tingling, um, decreased capillary reflow. And you can actually show your patients how to check that um, uh, pain out of proportion. And uh, you want to get yourself a repeat shoulder x-ray making sure you didn't chip anything when you got it back in there and that the bone is where it's supposed to be and then of course they need to have follow-up usually with an orthopedic surgeon within three days or so all right so how do we reduce a shoulder uh well uh first of all we want to talk a little bit about analgesia so successful reduction it, it is dependent on getting those muscles relaxed and the only way to get muscles relaxed is to reduce the pain that the patient is experiencing. So uh, there are two ways, and a lot of times we do a kind of a combination of both. One is procedural sedation and analgesia. Uh, of course, anytime you, you have procedural sedation, you sedate a patient. There are some risks that come with it, like respiratory depression, aspiration, and such. So you want to make sure that your patient is healthy enough to undergo procedural sedation, although it is pretty safe. Uh, and then an alternative to that would be an intraarticular uh, lidocaine, so an analgesic that you inject right into the joint. And uh, because it's within the joint itself, if you put it where it's supposed to go, you have pretty high success rates. And I've seen uh, a lot of my colleagues tend to use a combination of both. Um, so what you'll want to do is get your patient in a comfortable position. Uh, either That's going to be either seated or kind of semi-recumbent. And you're going to, you know, of course, get familiarized with your anatomical landmarks, understanding that your, your shoulder is dislocated. So trying to figure out where the joint is might be a little tricky. Uh, you're going to withdraw the medication that you need, uh, and you'll put a 20 or 22 gauge uh, needle on there. And what the, the provider here is demonstrating is a lateral injection technique. So we're going just under the acromion as it wraps around here. Uh, into that subacromial bursa area and uh, so we'll insert we'll clean the skin of course insert the needle and kind of as you're in inserting it you're kind of pulling on the plunger as you're going 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 in and then as soon as you get within the joint you'll see a little bit of that synovial fluid kind of shoot up into the syringe and that's how you know you're in uh, you'll uh, aspirate a little bit of the fluid and then you'll push the medication. And anytime you're pushing medication into a joint, it should flow smooth like butter. Okay, so you put a little bit of lidocaine in there, um, and then you let it sit for a, a few minutes. It works pretty fast, uh, although your textbook is is recommending about 15 minutes post injection that you start um, trying to manipulate the shoulder. All right, so these are the different techniques that we're going to be learning. For the anterior shoulder dislocation, which is way more common, we're going to be learning uh, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, and for the posterior is the same as this one, the traction counter traction. And we'll go one by one, kind of describing the differences between them and when to use them, etc. So the first one is the Ferris technique. Uh, it is Ferris, uh, meaning fast, reliable, and safe. And it is, or it should be, the technique uh, is first line recommended by your textbook. Uh, and it has a pretty high success rate, as you can see, fast, reliable, and safe, uh, about 88 to 95% percent um, uh, reduction. So what you want to do is have the patient supine. This is after you've administered some sort of analgesia or sedation or intraarticular analgesia. What you'll do is you'll grab the, uh, the patient at the wrist and kind of shaking their hand with your other hand. And as you're doing that, you will start um, slowly abducting the arm. Now remember, anytime you're pulling the arm away from midline, it's gonna start being just uncomfortable for the patient. And what you do is you kind of just gently oscillate the, the arm up and down and up and down and up and down as you're abducting the arm. And you're going little by little, just relaxing that muscle and pulling a little bit of traction. So you're pulling the arm kind of out of the, out of its socket a bit towards you. 
keep going, keep going, keep going. Once the arm uh, gets about 90 degree angle, then you have then you want to start also externally rotating at the shoulder, externally rotating. Keep going, keep going, keep going, and usually by about 120 degrees, you will get the reduction. You usually feel kind of a little clunk when the shoulder goes back into place. Uh, after that, you will put the patient back in a comfortable position, which is bending the elbow 90 degrees and putting it on their in their chest or stomach area. And it, for me, I like to see things. I mean, reading this is great, but actually seeing it happen is way better to help my mental uh, image stick. So that is the fairs technique, right? Uh, should be your your go-to first line. Now I will tell you that when you get out in, on your rotation, especially ER rotation, you'll find that each ER provider kind of has their go-to uh, first line uh, reduction techniques. And certainly don't go tell your preceptor, oh, I, Professor Gonzalez said you should always try this one first. I mean, everybody has their ways and there's not uh, always just one right way to do things. So. Um, another technique to use is called the ad adduction external rotation method. Um, so the patient has their uh, their arm at their side and the flexed elbow at 90 degrees. Uh, you're applying gentle traction, so you're pulling it down and out of the, the socket. And then, if needed, slightly abduct the arm while the while still in the rotated position. So essentially, this, this, and then this. Essentially, all you're doing is pulling the shoulder so it can relax. And usually, the patient can feel the shoulder kind of go back in, as well as the provider. Uh, two other techniques we want to talk about. This one is called the Stimson technique. And this is what I like to call set it and forget it, <laughs> okay? So if you're in a busy ER, you just do not have time uh, to to do this procedure, you, you're swamped, then you can try uh, to attempt to do the Stimson technique. And essentially what you do uh, is uh, get a weight. So usually within the ER, you'll have these weighted ties uh, between five and 15 kilograms. You'll, you'll have the patient drape their affected shoulder off the edge of the bed and you will tie uh, these weighted uh, bags to the, the wrist and this will pull traction on the shoulder joint and this alone on its own, if just leaving it there for 15-20 minutes, um, will a, a lot of times reduce spontaneously. Uh, a lot of times when we do this Stimson technique, we'll actually add on another technique, which is called the scapular manipulation. And in this technique, essentially what we're doing is we're trying to move the scapula uh, kind of up this way so that this kind of slides uh, the glenohumeral area right back towards the head. And so a lot of times they'll use these two in combination. One of the doctors I used to work with in Dallas just swore by scapular manipulation, said it was the least barbaric and most effective for him. Um, so the combination of Stimson and scapular manipulation has a great success rate, 92 to 97% success. So it really just depends on your style and your technique, uh, what you learn while you're on ER rotation or ortho, and then just kind of adapting it for whatever you need. Last one uh, is probably the most barbaric, I guess you could say. Uh, it's actually the one that I've seen done the most, which is kind of crazy, uh, but because it's kind of the most kind of old school, kind of macho, like I'm a big doctor, I'm going to get this arm back in place. Uh, so I've seen it a lot and I've been, I've actually helped uh, be the counter attraction person, which is this arm here or this, this person here. Um, so essentially what you do is you get the patient supine and you're going to wrap a sheet around their affected axilla. And then this sheet can either wrap around the second provider or if you don't have someone to help you, you can tie it to the bed. Then you have another sheet that you wrap around yourself and that wraps around the forearm of the patient at 90 degrees. Uh, you're going to be held holding the patient in traction, pulling for 15 minutes. Here's another reason why it's not as utilized because it does take a long time uh, for this shoulder to relax 
And essentially, all you do is can slightly abduct the arm away from the chest. Uh, you kind of hold traction, and eventually, it just kind of clunks right back into place. So, now, uh, this video has a uh, ten different ways to reduce uh, shoulder, uh, and it it goes through and shows you all the different ones. I think there are some residents that are that are performing them. So I would definitely take the time to watch them. Uh, you can see all the differences in the techniques more than, than the amount that I showed you. All right. So that's shoulder reductions. Uh, make sure that you know the differences between the different techniques if I describe them. Um, and then if, be sure to recognize the difference between an anterior and posterior shoulder dislocation based on uh, x-ray findings and, and mechanism and uh, how which uh, procedure that you would do for either one. Okay. All right, so moving on. We're going to talk about radial head subluxation or aka nursemaid's elbow. I'm sure that y'all learned about this in orthopedics uh, or your MSK um, uh, module. And here we have a picture of a toddler being dangled by their family member. Um, a lot of kids just love that swinging motion, kind of fun for them. And so they'll, they'll be you know, one hand with one family member, one hand in the other, and they do this kind of swinging thing. Uh, well, that pulling that pull it, upward pulling on a dangly arm is the mechanism of injury for this. And the reason why they call it a nursemaid's elbow is back in the day, uh, the aristocrats, kids were not necessarily taken care of by their parents, they were taken care of by nursemaids. And when kids misbehave, I don't know how many of y'all have been around kids or have kids, but when kids tend to not get their way, they kind of do this thing where they kind of melt in place. I don't know if you've ever seen them kind of melt. And I, you can imagine you're trying to grab the kid and move them a certain direction and they melt against that, can pull up on that arm and dislocate or, or subluxate, I should say, the, the radial head. Um, it is the most common elbow injury in kids. It, it is, I would say, pretty easy to diagnose. It's something that you should always have on your radar for kids, especially when the mechanism fits. Um, most commonly between kids age one and four. And again, mentioned that sudden axial traction, so sudden pulling or jerking of the arm upward um, causes that portion of the anterior ligament around the radial head to kind of slip and it becomes entrapped. And if the kid comes in and they fell on their arm, it's not, that is not the most likely um, diagnosis. If they come in and their sibling pulled them or their babysitter or their parent, then you should be starting to think, hmm, this could be a, a nursemaid's elbow. Um, they usually present with the, uh, the refusal to use the arm. So they hold it kind of close to their side, elbow slightly flexed, but, but the forearm pronated, okay? And they won't use it. No matter what you try to offer them, you try to offer them a million bucks, a piece of candy, a uh, popsicle, they will not use their arm because it hurts too bad. Um, use your judgment. So if the history cl fixed the classic presentation, no fall, no direct trauma, uh, and it was witnessed, then you can proceed to the reduction without getting imaging first. But if maybe there's kind of a iffy presentation, you're not sure, uh, definitely get the x-ray first, okay? There are two techniques that we use. I have done many of these uh, reductions before, and I will kind of give you my take on what to do. So again, indications. You can see that this child is not moving. Uh, a pronated forearm, arm at their side. This is a nursemaid double injury. So indications, radial head subluxation. Yes, that's easy, right? Yeah. Um, contraindications. Well, if we think there's a fracture, we should certainly not be manipulating this kid's arm, okay? Uh, complications. The major complication is not being able to get it in. Now, I have seen many kids with this, and I've never been, never not been able to reduce it, okay? Post-procedure instructions. 
I always do a really detailed description of what's going to happen with parents before I do it so that they know what to expect. Um, and uh, afterwards, after the shoulder, after the elbow is reduced, it, you, the kid is still a little scared, a little timid, um, and a little traumatized. So they tend to take a little bit to kind of start trying to move their arm again. Um, after it's reduced, you don't need any other treatment. Um, you can, you know, they can continue moving it just as they were, have no activity restrictions. Uh, the, the only other thing that you could recommend is if they're dis if they're still having discomfort, you can tell the parents they can give them some over-the-counter uh, ibuprofen or acetaminophen. Um, you should also inform the parents that there is an increased risk of recurrence once the child has the uh, subluxation once. Um, so to show them the mechanism, show them that lifting up is what causes it so that they can avoid having that happen in the future. Uh, now, again, just like with the shoulder dislocation, we should only attempt to reduce it um, a couple times. And if we still cannot, that, that might mean that there is something blocking that way. It shouldn't be that difficult. And so at that, at that point, you would want to get orthopedic involved. All right. So from personal experience, hyperpronation is my go-to first uh, reduction technique because it is a lot less invasive, a lot less traumatic, and it looks a lot less painful, okay? And so a lot of times what I'll do is I have, if I have a high suspicion and the history matches, I'll actually perform this hyperpronation as I'm doing physical exam. And what you do is you kind of try to get the, the, <laughs> the child calm enough, getting down to their level. Um, uh, if, if they're pretty small, I'll have them actually sit in their mom's lap so that they're more comfortable. Uh, grab the, uh, I examine everything else first, get to the affected arm. Um, and then what you do is you kind of grip the forearm with the other hand and you hyperpronate. So you pronate it more than it already is. And what you'll feel with your, with your, uh, opposite hand at the elbow area is a little click and literally just like if you just tapped a little you just feel that little tiny click if they're older kid maybe a little pop but it's definitely not a big pop or a clunk it's just a little click you will feel it and then the kid usually cries for a little bit because it's a little uncomfortable you leave them alone go out of the room uh come back in with a popsicle and they'll grab it from you Okay, so this is the, the hyperpronation. It's my go-to first technique for reducing. And uh, like I said, I usually try to do it while I am examining the patient because it just like kills two burns with one stone. Uh, if I have to send the patient for x-ray, if I'm unsure if the mechanism is fitting, uh, then a lot of times what actually happens is while they're in x-ray, if it is a nurse made double, the radiology tech will actually reduce it for us kind of inadvertently. But it's definitely um, a plus. You know, the kid will come back from x-ray moving their arm again. Like, what would happen? Second technique. And this technique does look a, a bit more um, like you're actually cranking the arm a bit. And so the parents can, can be a little more uh, anxious for this technique. And this, is, this technique I definitely explain before I do it. Um, get down to the child's level. Support the affected arm. Bending the elbow 90 degrees, your thumb is going to be right on top of that radial head area, putting a little bit of pressure. You're going to grip the forearm with the other hand, and you're, um, uh, you're going to grasp the hand. You're going to supinate and flex at the same time, bringing the elbow all the way up. And again, you should feel an auditory click or a pop. Um, and after that, you, know, you wait. Um, wait a little bit and then come back in and recheck them. In your textbook, it says hyperpronation should be attempted as supination, flexion fails. I'll tell you, in my personal opinion, uh, I always do hyperpronation first and then this one. And there have been a few instances where hyperpronation didn't work and this did. And it's usually with older kids. They're a little less flexible. Okay. Once you're done, uh, usually document a high five test and you go back in there and you ask them for high five with their affected arm uh, or I come in giving them a sticker or a popsicle and, and having them grab with their injured arm. 
All right, so we finished the reductions. Now we're going to talk about joint injections. Uh, we're going to talk about shoulder injections first. Here's some videos that you can watch. Uh, so shoulder injections. Uh, the shoulder is the most mobile joint in the body. It's a mobile and it also pretty um, strong joint. Um, so there, there is a lot of potential for injury because it's so mobile uh, and we should be familiar with the anatomy of the shoulder. If you're not familiar with it, please brush up on your anatomy. Um, what, what is usually termed as a shoulder injection is the subacromial bursa, which is a uh, sub beneath the acromion in this area. And that's kind of synonymous with a shoulder injection. And that, that's the injection we're going to be talking about. There are some other injections that you can do, uh, but we will be talking about the subacromial bursal injection aka shoulder injection and we're going to be talking about the three different kinds uh, nowadays for joint injections we use a lot of ultrasound um, and you can bill for that too so uh, if you're working in orthopedic clinic a lot of times you're going to be doing ultrasound guided joint injections we're not going to talk about that for the sake of this lecture but just know that that does that is very commonly done okay so why do we want to do shoulder injections? Well, the number one issue with shoulders is impingement syndrome, getting pinching within that joint. Uh, other, th other reasons why you would want to do shoulder injections, when we say shoulder injections, we're talking about steroid shoulder injections. Um, other than calcific tendonitis, supraspinatus tendonitis, subacromial bursitis, and adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder are all indications for a joint injection. Contraindications. You're going to see a lot of these contraindications over and over again throughout these procedures, uh, some of which are uncooperative patient. Anytime you have uh, an uncooperative patient, meaning that they cannot sit still or cooperate, uh, you will do more harm than damage by trying to inject them, accidentally poking yourself or poking them where you're not supposed to. <clears throat> so uh, uncooperative patient is contraindicated. Although I find that the more you explain things to your patients, the less uncooperative that they are, uh, although some can't help it. Uh, other reasons why you shouldn't, bleeding diathesis or coagulopathy, this is going to be a common one. Also, bacteremia cellulitis, should never stick a needle through infected skin. And last but not least, and the one that I want you to remember the most, because it's very specific for shoulder injections, is evidence of complete rotator cuff tear. I'm probably going to ask you that on your test, so just go ahead and commit that to memory. What can happen with shoulder injections? Well, anytime you inject steroids under, into the skin, you can get some atrophy or kind of um, waste, wasting away of the skin at the injection site. Uh, you can get some vitiligo at that site. Uh, you can get um, some calcification around the joint capsule. Of course, you're injecting a steroid, so your blood glucose can go up uh, transiently. And last but not least, you can cause a tendon rupture, although those are not common. Uh, other things can happen. Post-injection flare, anytime you inject a joint with steroids, a lot of times it'll get better, it'll get better, then it'll get worse before it gets better, better. Um, you can, anytime you stick a needle in a joint, you can accidentally introduce an infection. Uh, getting a Cushing syndrome is not common with the small amount of steroids that we're injecting in the shoulder. Although if you're getting them too frequently, it can certainly be a potential complication. Uh, a couple other things, cataracts, facial erythema, again, coming from that uh, Cushing syndrome. All right, so afterwards, after we inject the patient, what are we going to recommend they do? Well, we're going to keep them seated for several minutes after the injection. Some patients can get a little woozy after they get a shot. Um, you're going to... Uh, make sure that the medication was, was injected into the right location, kind of put them through some passive range of motion. And when you, when you do that, it should be more comfortable after injecting it because you do inject some lidocaine as well. Uh, we like to keep the patients in office, monitoring them for at least 30 minutes. I will want to inform the patient to avoid strenuous activity uh, for at least 48 hours. And then just explain to your patient that the symptoms usually, once the lidocaine wears off, the symptoms usually have a flare where it gets worse. And then over the next 24 to 48 hours, it starts improving. 
All right, so let's talk about the lateral approach. So lateral approach is the approach that you will be doing in, in, in lab if you haven't already learned how to do that. Uh, the lateral approach, the patient should be seated, um, sitting up, hands kind of resting in their lap. You want the patient to try to relax their shoulder and their neck muscles. Uh, sometimes if they have kind of a crowded joint space, actually have your, your nurse or assistant kind of pull traction uh, at a, a 90 degree flexed elbow, kind of opening up that subacromial space. Uh, you will mark the area with a pen. So you don't necessarily have to mark the acromion, but you do want to mark the area. I usually use the kind of the top of the needle because when you wipe down the area, that pen mark might come off. So I usually use the cap of the needle and kind of in, make an indention on the skin. Um, once you do that, then you'll prep the skin with either chlorhexidine or probidum, prop, iodine. Just make sure the patient isn't allergic. Let it dry. Don't blow it. Don't don't fan your hand at it. Uh, you'll get uh, about a one inch, 20, 22 to 25 gauge needle, and you'll go just underneath the acromion. Uh, and the, the solution will be kind of a mixture of steroid and lidocaine. Um, if you hit bone or you hit firmness, you should redirect. And the redirection should be minimal because once the redirection occurs deeper within, uh, it's a lot bigger. So small adjustments. Uh, once you're in, uh, you can withdraw slightly. You might get a little bit of that fl fluid, synovial fluid. If you don't, that's okay. Uh, and then you inject. And when you inject, it should be easy like butter to be able to push that medication through. Um, and then after that, you put a sterile bandage on there, have the patient kind of rest their shoulder, and you can not immobilize it, but rest it, ice, and uh, it can take some um, Tylenol for soreness. All right, so that was lateral approach. We have two other approaches for shoulder injection. This is the anterior approach. So for the anterior approach, uh, what we the landmarks that we want to find are the coracoid process and the head of the humerus. Uh, so while you're sitting there watching this, uh, I want you to kind of palpate on your own shoulder and try to find that coracoid process. Find your clavicle uh, kind of laterally and then come down a little bit and you'll feel just a little knob. It's kind of deep, especially if you have larger pecs. And then what you'll do is palpate that coracoid process and then lateral to that, you'll feel the head of the humerus. And where you'll want to go uh, anteriorly is just between those two landmarks. Um, you're going to direct your needle posteriorly and slightly superior laterally, as you can see here in this uh, video, I mean in this picture. And, and that's it. You just do the same process before cleaning and such, but you inject there instead. Uh, last technique is going to be the posterior approach. Um, I tend to prefer this approach uh, because the patient can't really see what's going on and it just seems to be the easiest one to do, for me at least. Um, but really everyone uh, uh, uses different techniques, whichever suits suits you and for your needs. Um, a lot of times these are done with, with ultrasound and things uh, accompanying them like we mentioned before. So for posterior, what you'll do is, uh, you can see this is the acromion, uh, the spine of the scapula, which becomes the acromion. As soon as it starts taking this turn, the turn, you're going to go just south of that, and you'll feel this kind of this empty spot. And that empty spot is where you're going to be doing the injection. It's a little groove right where the acromion starts to turn. And so what you'll do is, two to three centimeters uh, inferior to the corner, um, you will direct anteriorly towards the coracoid process. So this is the coracoid process on the front. You're gonna go in that, um, in that direction and then inject the steroid. So those are the shoulder injections. Uh, we have been at it for about 50 minutes now. So this would be a good time to take a quick break uh, if you need one. And then um, come back and we'll continue with the procedures. All right. Next up are these golf ball elbows.
And it's not because of playing golf. It just looks like these patients have big old golf balls on their elbows. This is called a lecrodon bursa bursitis or lecrodon bursa uh, swelling inflammation. Uh, and so what we're going to learn here is how to do aspiration and injection. So the electronon bursa is uh, in and around the electronon process of the ulna. And it sits there to kind of protect, uh, help the skin kind of freely glide over the bony process. And so what we tend to see is because of its superficial location, uh, patients that are on their hands and knees a lot, uh, like laying carpet or tile, uh, doing a lot of manual labor and repetitive movements are those that get these tend to get these inflamed. Um, otherwise, with, without the repetitive movements, uh, patients with gout, rheumatoid arthritis, CPPD, and, and even infections can get these uh, bursa inflamed. So if it is, in fact, you know, erythematic, warm, tender, uh, you should be thinking that it could potentially be a septic bursitis. Um, you, you must then get cultures from there um, uh, to confirm that diagnosis. And you should certainly exclude infection before injecting steroids into that olecranon bursa. Uh, leukocyte count can help determine whether there is infection versus inflammatory. Uh, and you can also use the gram stain and culture. Okay. So main takeaway from that is if you think it could be infected, test it before you inject it with lidocaine. I mean with, with steroid. So indications, if you have, um, either symptomatic or cosmetic concerns over the enlargement or distension of the electron bursa. And also if you suspect some sort of either crystalloid or septic bursitis. Well, contraindications are few, uh, uncooperative patient and bleeding diathesis or coagulopathy, uh, complications. So what happens is we can drain the balloon up, but the body still makes fluid and it can actually kind of re refill. And so uh, good to do some pressure dressing afterwards to keep it deflated. Um, you can, in some cases, if you don't perform this, the technique sterilely, introduce an infection, inoculate. Um, uh, you can also have some persistent drainage. You can uh, accidentally hit or damage the, the ulnar nerve if you go use the improper approach. And then you can also get some skin and fat atrophy, hyper, hypopigmentation, uh, because the bursa is so superficial. After you're done with this procedure, you're going to have the patient use some NSAIDs, compression dressing so that it doesn't reinflate with fluid. Uh, if you have repeated uh, bursitis, you might consider a splint to help reduce the range of motion uh, and have the patient return for reevaluation, um, assess for reaccumulation, persistent drainage or infection. And also, if you're thinking that it could be an uh, infection, uh, you would definitely want to test that before you inject it with steroids. So here's the actual procedure. Of course, you want to get informed consent. Informed consent is very important with any procedure. Uh, and most of the time it is written informed consent. Sometimes it can be verbal. Um, you'll wash your hands, get your materials prepped, um, put your gloves on. You have the patient seated, elbows going to be flexed 90 degrees and supported usually on a table. Uh, we will approach the elbow on the lateral side so as to avoid the ulnar nerve, which wraps around the medial side. Uh, you'll wipe down the area with either uh, iodine or chlorhexidine or even alcohol, uh, but do not touch the injection site after you swab it so that it stays sterile. You'll get a 25 gauge needle about an inch long. And uh, I usually have a little more than a 3 ml syringe and usually 5 to 10. And you're going to uh, inject a little bit of lidocaine to create a wheel. So when we say wheel on the skin, it's a tiny little uh, bl bubble or blurb of, of medicine under the skin. So, so ang angling your needle very superficially so that the skin becomes numb, just the skin. Then once you numb that, you could redirect your needle into 
the bursa, and this is the, the 18 gauge needle because you're going to be aspirating the fluid. 18 gauge needle, and then 10 ml syringe, aspirate the fluid, collect it, and send it off to the lab for the, the following uh, evaluations if needed. Then you'll want to apply pressure once you remove it, um, once you remove that um, needle, and place a sterile pressure bandage. Uh, and that will be the aspiration part. Remember, we want to do aspirate and send this fluid off before we, we inject it with steroid. So once the patient um, patient's aspirate from the initial procedure returns and it's inflammatory and non-infectious, then we can consider the corticosteroid injection. And what we'll do is we'll, pre we'll prep it just the same way um, with the uh, lidocaine, I'm sorry, with the iodine. And then what, what we do is kind of still same on the lateral side, um, kind of going perpendicular, kind of up and down into that area. Uh, you will inject it with steroids. So moving on, uh, we're going to talk about ganglion cysts and uh, ganglia aspiration and injection. Uh, these are very, very common. I have several family members that have had them. Um, I'm sure in our class, someone has had one before. Uh, and maybe when we get to class, I can ask the audience and we can see. So ganglion cysts are very common. They're soft tissue tumors uh, that come around the joint capsules are very common in the wrist and hand area. And they can be mobile and vary from large to pretty small. We see it more commonly in women between the ages of 20 and 40 years old. And we have multiple techniques for, uh, for intervention, some of which are better than others. The first technique we see here <laughs> it is probably the, the most, uh, uh, I guess, layman's or... Uh, old wives tale um, methods called the Bible technique. Literally, you grab your Bible out of your nightstand and smack it. So certainly not the, the technique that we would uh, want to use in our clinics, but know that it is out there. You just smack it and it, and it ruptures. Um, we're not going to want to do that in the clinic. We have better, more humane ways of, of tackling this. Uh, what I see here is with a needle aspiration alone, when you just take that jelly goopy stuff out, you get about 50% recurrence rate, so not great. With needle aspiration and steroid, you get about a 13 to 50% recurrence rate. And then, of course, surgical intervention, you get much less recurrence. Um, surgically, you'd have to cut it open and take it out. So I would say if you're going to do it and you don't have any contraindications, a needle aspiration with corticosteroid would probably be my first line. And then after that, uh, potentially surgical intervention. So, excuse me. Uh, so why would we want to drain a ganglia? Well, if it's not bothering a patient, you don't necessarily have to do anything about it. However, if it is causing limitation of motion, pain, weakness, paresthesias, those are all indications to go ahead and drain the cyst. Um, of course, if you have any type of infectious concern, we wouldn't inject steroids. Um, and then you can also just do the technique just for cosmetic uh, reasons. Contraindications, same ones that we've had before. Uncooperative patient, if the ganglia overlies artificial joint, you do not want to. Uh, coagulopathy or bleeding diathesis and presence of septic arthritis or bacteria. Now, remember that these are all relative contraindications, meaning that if we need to do the procedure and they have some of these but are not that risky, then you can go ahead and still proceed. It's not an absolute contraindication. Complications. So recurrence is the most common complication, meaning that it comes back. Um, in infection, bleeding, nerve injury, I mean, you're injecting under the skin. There's a lot of tendons and nerves and things that run into the hand. So that can be injured. You can also get some stiffness and decreased range of motion. 
You can get fat atrophy, skin atrophy, hypopigmentation because of the steroid. And depending on where it is, you can injure or uh, temporarily injure the radial, radial nerve. After the procedure, uh, a lot of times we like to splint and compress the area so that it doesn't refill. And usually using something like an ace wrap or a volar sprint, splint. Um, after several days, start encouraging range of motion so we don't get that, that wrist frozen. And they should come back in about a week to check for reaccumulation, persistent drainage, or signs of infection. Alright, so how do we do it? Well, pretty simple, straightforward. Uh, we will wash our hands, gain consent, get everything ready, prep the skin, uh, get a, a small needle, inject some subcutaneous to create a wheel, and then we will swap out the needle for an 18 gauge, stick it into the cyst itself, and aspirate, and then usually get this thick kind of gel-like material. After that, you can actually leave the You'll, you'll actually want to leave that needle in place because it's already where it should be. And then you will uh, remove the syringe, keeping the needle in place, and replace with the syringe filled with your steroid and lidocaine. And then uh, you'll just go ahead and directly administer that. Uh, remove your needle. Apply your gauze and clean the area. Bandage it up. Keep the patient in the office just to make sure they tolerate the procedure well and then let them go. So if you move that large needle when you change out from the aspiration to the injection, you can actually move the needle out of the joint capsule, which is uncomfortable and it causes a higher recurrence rate. Um, also just want to avoid the radial artery. Uh, if you have a ganglion cyst on the volar aspect of your wrist. These are obviously on the dorsum. All right, carpal tunnel. I highly doubt that there is a single student in this, in this virtual classroom that has not heard of carpal tunnel syndrome. I would say that all of us have heard about it at some point. What we have is entrapment of the median nerve that travels underneath the transverse carpal ligament through what's called the carpal tunnel. And uh, patients tend to get a lot of numbness, tingling, and pain in the area of the wrist in the first three digits. It's very frequently, it presents very frequently. Um, women are more affected than males. Uh, they, like I said before, they tend to get paresthesias, pain, uh, and we can help diagnose that by the tenel, which is tapping at the wrist area, or phalen, having the wrists flexed. A phalen flex, tenel tapping makes perfect sense. Um, of course, a lot of times we try conservative methods of treatment, or the patient has already tried conservative methods of treatment, including rest, ice, splinting, uh, NSAIDs. Um, you do have at least a 70% short-term benefit with injections, according to studies. Um, if the repeat injections are failing, surgery should be considered. So indications, any signs or symptoms suggesting median nerve compression, um, no muscle wasting. Contraindications, so it's not usually done in pediatric populations um, and in pregnancy. So why do you think that we don't do these in pregnancy. Well, in the third trimester of pregnancy, again, I don't know how many of y'all been pregnant before or had pregnant family members, but women tend to get swollen all over the place the last trimester. Uh, very uncomfortable. Uh, but essentially, the carpal tunnel that is caused in the third trimester is usually due to swelling, not due to anatomical deformity. And so most of the time we just uh, advise that the patient carry out the rest of the pregnancy and then after the pregnancy is relieved, after you have the baby, the carpal tunnel should go away.
on its own without any um, additional treatment. Shouldn't inject into infection. If you have some sort of mass there, you shouldn't inject. Uh, bleeding disorders are quite healthy and then uncooperative patient. Complications. Well, uh, after you do any type of steroid injection, a lot of times you have a steroid flare. It gets worse before it gets better. Um, certainly, we want to try to avoid this, but you could essentially accidentally inject into the nerve. It can also cause some bruising at the skin. Afterwards, you're going to want to rest the wrist, uh, wear a splint, uh, and use ice NSAIDs to help relieve the pain. How do we do it? Well, you can either go uh, to the medi or medial to or lateral to the palmaris longus tendon. That's your landmark. You'll have the patient kind of sitting supine, arm fully extended, and you'll have the patient kind of make a fist against some resistance, which will kind of pop up that palmaris longus tendon. And then you'll look for the second set of creases on the wrist. So um, I don't see a good picture, but kind of you'll see some creases, second set of creases. Uh, there's the transverse cre crease of the wrist. Um, and then you will, um, like I said, you can either inject on the, the left or the right of palmaris longus. Um, you get your, your, your syringe, fill it up with your medications, prep the wrist, um, and then you'll advance the tip of the needle about a centimeter below the surface of the hand into the carpal tunnel space. Um, and then you inject a, the steroid, a lidocaine, in that area. And what you'll notice is the patient should have numbness in the median nerve distribution after you inject that medication because of the lidocaine. Um, and then you place a bandage. And, uh, it's it's not too difficult to do. The only time when it does get a little difficult is when the patient doesn't have a palmaris longus at all, which we know some patients can do. Uh, but you just try your best to get it in the right area. Um, the medicine and the needle should pass easily into the canal. If you start hitting resistance, you're probably in a tendon. Uh, so you got to kind of back out and go back in a different angle. Um, if the patient if you touch the patient's nerve with your needle, they're definitely going to have some pain, pain and numbness tingling uh, acutely in the median distribution. So you'll definitely want to re, um, redirect it if that happens. All right, moving on, let's talk about Dequer veins. So Dequer veins is an inflammation of the, uh, the thumb, uh, proximally, and it is a stenosing, uh, tenosynovitis of the short and long thumb abductor tendons, which are running kind of along the uh, radial side of the forearm, distally. Um, usually as a result of chronic microtrauma, so doing the same things over and over again. So my mom actually got decor veins pretty bad when she was uh, taking care of my son when he was a baby. And she, she, with her thumbs, um, uh, abducted, flexed and abducted, she would lift up and underneath the arms and she kept putting uh, pressure on the, uh, the thumb abductors and got this uh, decor veins and got swollen and uncomfortable. Um, pain, tenderness, swelling, warmth. Uh, you can do a Finkelstein test to diagnose it where you have the patient place their thumb underneath a closed fist and you tilt your hand down getting pain in that area. You can give up to three uh, injections at monthly intervals before doing surgery to release that compartment. All right, so decorvenes that's not improved with conservative measures is an, is an indication for this injection. Uh, relative contraindication is going to be uncooperative patient and uncontrolled diabetes, as well as infection of the overlying skin, bleeding disorders, allergic reactions. Complications. Uh, so you can introduce an infection. You can cause a tendon rupture. If you're not careful, you can cause blood sugars to go up, um, pain, post-injection flare, atrophy, hypopigmentation. After you're done with the procedure, you're going to want to tell the patient to rest the wrist, encourage them to wear a splint, um, and use ice and NSAIDs to help relieve the pain. All right, so 
uh, whenever I do this injection, I like to do it injecting up towards the patient. And um, you can do it either way. Um, but I like to go kind of up towards the patient. Um, you can you have the patient kind of move their thumb to see where the landmarks are and where the point of maximal pain is. Prep the skin. Have the patient gently flex and extend the thumb. And you're going to inject the needle into the area and have the patient moving their thumb so that you make sure that you do not insert the needle into the tendon itself. And so if the patient's moving their finger and they feel kind of a scratchy sensation, uh, that's the needle kind of touching that tendon. Um, and you'll want to, to move, withdraw the needle a little bit before. Don't inject it in there. So you'll withdraw, have the patient move their thumb again, and then you'll inject. You can also, like I said, do for, from the opposite direction. I just find it's easier to do it this way. Moving on, we have trigger finger. Trigger finger is also really common, especially in diabetic patients. I don't know why, uh, but they are pretty common. Uh, essentially, what happens is you get entrapment of the A1 pulley, uh, and the tendon gets stuck in the trigger position, just like if you were pulling the trigger on a pistol. Uh, can it, it locks in that place, and the fourth finger is the most common finger involved in trigger finger. Um, uncomplicated. First line therapy should be, um, you know, just conservative measures, although you can move up to steroid therapy and then, of course, surgery if that does not help. You can give two or three injections, but if, if those fail, then you should uh, refer to the surgeon. So locking of the finger, I don't know if you've ever seen, is very uncomfortable. I, I, have, I just recently started getting some triggering in my pinky finger. Um, I think it's from repetitive injuries when I played basketball back in the day. So why shouldn't we? Failure to respond, uncooperative patient, bleeding diathesis, sound familiar? Yeah. Of course, congenital trigger thumb in infants, I, I wouldn't inject that either. Uh, complications, these are all pretty, um, pretty straightforward. A soreness, syncope, because they're actually watching the procedure, pain, can break the needle if you accidentally inject it in the, the tendon, infection, tenderness, all the above. Post, post instructions, there's a lot of post instructions for trigger finger. We usually don't splint, uh, some do, uh, but I have never been taught to splint after these injections. Um, like I said, after multiple attempts, you're going to want to refer. Uh, looking for infection, bleeding. Uh, it usually has a little bit of tenderness that increases before it gets better. And sometimes you can actually also get some, some numbness throughout the fingers because the medication kind of infiltrates the nerves. Uh, and I think that's about it. So here you go. We have a triggered finger. Like we said, fourth finger is most common. Um, you're going to place the hand flat on a firm surface, prep the area with alcohol, and then you're going to inject from the patient's um, wrist towards their fingers. And uh, you'll want to insert the needle so that the tip uh, is around that A1 pulley area. Uh, and you'll inject the anti-inflammatory medication, let it sit. Um, I usually kind of rub it in a little bit while it's there. Uh, make sure that you inject at the correct spot. The A1 pulley is a little more proximal than the crease that is there uh, from that connects the digit to the to the hand. So just make sure that you palpate it, and you will start about a centimeter proximal to that, so that your needle in inserts into that sheath. Um, all right.
All right, we made our way all the way to the lower extremities. This would also be a good time to take a quick break if you need a break. So get up, stretch your legs, um, get a drink, and then come back and we'll finish the last few procedures. There's significantly less lower extremity um, than there are upper extremity. All right, so first off, let's talk about the greater trochanteric bursal injection. So remember the greater trochanter is here. It's uh, one of the bony landmarks on the femur. And up uh, sitting over the greater trochanter in this area is this greater trochanteric bursa. And then over that, we have the iliotibial band that's coming kind of along the entire lateral thigh. And so bursitis, uh, it's inflammation, um, in that area, you can get it from, you know, overuse, uh, from inflammation, uh, and it causes pretty significant pain and, and is palpable in that area. Um, usually, these injections are pretty successful uh, in, in treating no matter what the cause is of the inflammation or pain. Um, usually the patients complain of that localized pain around the greater trochanter area and it's worse when you lay on that side. Uh, sometimes you have some focal swelling as well. So treat, why do you do it? Because you have discomfort. Why not? Well, drug allergy, infection, if you have had minimal relief after prior injections, coagulopathy, diabetes, joint prosthesis, um, Complications, you can get some local complications. Now, remember, this is a lower limb, so you are injecting a bit more medication than you are on the upper. So you do tend to see more steroid-related side effects, uh, like steroid flares, fat atrophies, um, local reactions. And then the, the systemic ones, such as facial flushing, adrenal suppression, transient glucose um, raising. So you see there are more side effects with this because there's more medication in a larger joint bursa. After you're done with the procedure, you're going to instruct the patient uh, to kind of gently move the area uh, to rest, to avoid aggravating activities. And um, it's not recommended that you have uh, more than three to four injections in a given year and that you wait at least six weeks between injections. So here's some of your landmarks, lateral uh, proximal th uh, thigh area. Um, you get consent, clean and position, find your landmarks, mark the area that you're gonna wanna inject, uh, clean the skin, uh, and then you'll, you'll, you'll inject the needle perpendicular to the skin and you'll actually hit the, the greater trochanter, hit the bone, and then you'll withdraw about two or three millimeters, aspirate, and then inject the medication. On these, uh, we're gonna wanna stick with, um, with a uh, Kenalog, uh, but it has a higher risk of atrophy than methylprednisolone. So there are different um, steroids that we can use. I don't necessarily need you to remember all of them, uh, but triamcinolone, tends to have a higher risk of tissue atrophy, so we'll want to stick with methylprednisolone if possible. Um, sometimes, because this bursa is so big, we can't get relief with just one injection. So what they'll, what they'll do is they'll actually take the needle and kind of fan along the entire bursal area, um, and that can help as well. Next, we're going to talk about knee injections and aspirations. So knee injections are done pretty frequently for a variety of different knee issues, uh, including osteoarthritis, gout, uh, and other things that can cause knee pain. Uh, in addition to that, uh, you can have fluid that accumulates within the joint, whether from a chronic condition or an acute issue, including infection. And so we'll talk about aspirations and injections and kind of 
how to approach them. So, arthrocentesis or withdrawing a fluid can be both diagnostic and therapeutic. Um, you can send it off for analysis. And it also relieves the discomfort, at least temporarily, drains off the fluids, and you can also put medication in. Uh, some of the common approaches to knee injections that I'll go through are going to be the superior lateral, the medial from a supine position, and then a sitting position flexed at 90 degrees. Uh, steroids, again, should not be injected into the joint if infection is suspected or confirmed. I think if anything you can take away from this lecture, it is don't inject it if it's infected. All right, so indications. So if, if we have a suspicion for a mono, uh, monoarthritis and it's unexplained, we don't know what's causing it, then we'll do the, the aspiration to withdraw fluid so we can send it for analysis. Um, we can remove, remove um, fluid from the knee. Uh, we can diagnose crystal-induced arthropathy. And we can administer viscous agents and glucocorticoids. So contraindications. Again, infection, big no-no. Bleeding, diathesis, or coagulopathy, uncooperative patient. Uh, don't use steroids in septic arthritis, which we've said multiple times. Uh, don't do it with joint prosthesis. Uh, if they didn't respond before, don't do it again. Uh, we should limit steroids to three to four times per year. If you have poorly controlled diabetes, you get you do get some systemic absorption of the steroids, so it can cause a uh, transient uh, elevation of the glucose. So we should be be aware or cautious with that. And then kids, let's just not inject kids. Let's let the specialists deal with them. Contraindications. I'm sorry, complications. It can cause an infection, although it is pretty rare to cause an infection. Uh, we should avoid strenuous activity for 24 hours, mention post-injection flare to our patients, and um, ther steroids, if used you know, multiple times, can theoretically cause some degeneration of the articular surface, so we should be careful with that. Post-procedure. So uh, we want to caution them risks and benefits uh, before they have the procedure done. Uh, they'll want to rest for 24 to 48 hours afterwards, avoid overusing the knee, um, keep for signs of infection, which we're aware of. Um, usually the knee will feel really good because you put some lidocaine in there, then it'll start to wear off, and then it'll take about one to two days for that steroid to really start kicking in, or the visco supplementation, which is kind of like extra gel coating that we put inside the knee. Um, you can ice and use NSAIDs. Um, so it, not all patients are going to benefit from these techniques, so if they don't, um, then we move on to other other things. All right, so we can see there's kind of four approaches, superior lateral, infralateral, inframedial, and supermedial. The first one we're going to talk about is the patellar tilt, which is the superior lateral approach. And this is the approach that you're probably learning in lab. So essentially uh, what, we, what we do is, uh, you know, we clean down the knee, uh, we're going to approach it from the superior, so upper, outer area. And we're going to use our offhand to kind of tilt that patella up and bring it towards us so that we have more space. Now, recall that the patella is kind of convex at the, the point of it. And in the middle parts, we like to stay above the, the center part of the, of the patella. So... So what you'll want to do is um, inject in, or clean the area first. Uh, you will usually put a little wheel of medication wherever you're going to be injecting, especially if you're going to be aspirating. Uh, you'll use your index finger and your thumb to kind of pull the patella towards you and tilt it upward. And that helps create space under the patella. And then you'll insert the needle kind of perpendicular to the long ass of the leg. So again, 
not with the leg, but against the leg. Um, you'll aspirate, and then you'll, in, if you need to aspirate a lot of medication, you'll go ahead and, I mean, sorry, fluid, you'll go ahead and aspirate. Uh, once that, once you're done aspirating, then you can use a lure lock or um, a needle driver to hold that 18 gauge in place and replace it with the steroid if you're going to be injecting steroid in there. So here's uh, visuals of that. This is the superior lateral approach. You can see that they kind of bring the patella towards the area and lift it. You get that above the patella, we're inserting into the that joint. Um, and then withdrawing the, the effusion, stabilizing it, and giving the medication as needed. See, it looks like it's a little higher than it than it should be for the knee, but remember that, that the knee bursts that go up above even the joint. So a lot of times what providers will do as they're trying to get in there is they'll kind of pull a little bit of traction on the on the on the on the syringe as they're going in so that when they get in that joint you see kind of a flash of fluid that fills up the syringe. All right, so the superior lateral traditional technique um, it's the same essential technique except you don't really move uh, the patella and you kind of slide your needle kind of towards the middle of the patella instead. You can also do superior medial technique where you come from the opposite side, the medial side. Then we have the anterior sitting or flex technique. Now we should only use this technique to inject and not to aspirate. And we should only use this on patients that we know have some osteoarthritis of the knee or some degenerative joint disease uh, because we can, because we're coming perpendicular to the tibial plateau, we can actually injure or inject into the, the uh, articular surface or the uh, menisci, so we want to avoid that. Most of the time, post patients coming in for knee joint injections have osteoarthritis, have degenerative joint disease, and so this work perfectly if you're just injecting into the knee. You have the patient 90 degrees, you find your landmarks, you can either go medial or lateral, and you just stick the needle in, withdraw, and push it. It should go in with no resistance. Here's the medial approach. Uh, it's pretty similar to the lateral approach. Um, you're going to pull the patella kind of towards you, lifting it up with the thumb. So very similar to the lateral approach. Um, you're just going to kind of aim at the midpoint, the medial aspect of the patella, and then guide the needle through. You can withdraw if needed, and then place the injection. Moving on, we have the plantar, plantar fascia injection. If we recall from my lectures in lower limb, we have this plantar aponeurosis, this fascia that connects at the calcaneus. And right in this area, patients tend to get a lot of tightness and pain. Um, and so the plantar fasciitis, most common cause, one of the most common causes of heel pain, it's usually worse with the first few steps in the morning and then lessens as activity continues. Uh, essentially, most of the time it's caused by like micro tears of the plantar fascia. And so the, the patient's trying to um, heal the area and we take step, it, it stretches and it re-tears. Uh, my little cousin used to be a, a pitcher, a softball pitcher in high school and in college for a little bit. And she, from pushing off the plate to do pitches, would get plantar fasciitis pretty bad. Um, a lot of times it'll go away on its own, so non-operative treatment results in 90% success, which is great. And sometimes we have to help the patient out a little bit by doing an, an injection. Um, steroids help a lot with this. Um, rupture is not common, 10% of patients, so uh, not common to have a rupture. Uh, we usually resort to injection after it's not improving with uh, 
with other treatments. Uh, absolute contraindications are going to be, you should not do them, local uh, cellulitis, septic arthritis, fracture, bacteremia, prosthesis, allergies to medications. Relative are going to be like fat pad atrophy, uncontrolled diabetes, etc. Complications, well, if we put a shot in something, it's going to likelihood that it might bleed, it might be more painful, like we said, about 10% chance of rupturing that plantar fascia, uh, atrophy, hypopigmentation, and pain. I mean, you're injecting in the bottom of the foot, which is has a lot of nerve fibers to help us pick up our foot if we step on something sharp, right? So the fact that we are on purpose sticking it with something sharp is uncomfortable to the patient. After you're done with the procedure, you're going to uh, apply some pressure, reduce the chance of steroid deposition in the dermal area, ice. And I think in a lot of these procedures, what we've been seeing them use is the ELSA spray, ELSA from, um, from Frozen. It is called ethyl chloride, and we inject it, we, we spray it at the area to help numb it before we finish uh, inserting the needle in. So we'll spray that, it freezes the skin, we insert the needle in. We only have those in fancy offices. We certainly don't have that in the ER. But it does come in handy, especially on the heel where it's very sensitive. So there's two approaches. One is the medial approach. Uh, I prefer to start with the medial approach. Um, what we'll do is kind of clean the area up, find our landmarks, and essentially starting medially but we are aiming for that point of uh, maximum pain and inflammation. Uh, clean the area, use a 25 gauge, about an inch, inch and a half long, and inject it kind of towards that area, kind of aiming for the end of that bone. And uh, you'll kind of withdraw and infiltrate to kind of give in a fan shape, so kind of back and forth to make sure that we get that medicine in the area. The plantar approach uh, you can do it. You can actually do both if you need to, but this one, uh, you're essentially finding that, that point of maximal tenderness, uh, using a cotton swab and then you kind of wipe it off a little bit and then you just stick the needle in there and you go ahead and put it in. That's pretty much it. Last but not least, we have trigger point injection. Um, and trigger points are common in other musculoskeletal conditions like, um, um, my goodness, I'm having a blank, fibromyalgia, uh, other chronic pain conditions. Uh, essentially what they are are uh, points of hyper irritable sites of skeletal muscle. So I don't know if you ever heard someone say they have a knot, right? Like I have a knot in my muscle, usually kind of up in the trap shoulder regions are the most common areas. And they usually have someone kind of try to massage it out. Well, the trigger points can be pretty uncomfortable to the point where you can limit patient's range of motion. And so one of the things that we can do aside from physical therapy and massage therapy is trigger point injections. Um, and so what we do is you can get some lidocaine, uh, or lidocaine plus the steroid and do these injections. Um, if the, the patient gets relieved of the pain, that's how we know we've done, we've done the right procedure. Okay. And a lot of times these patients come back and they get them again and again, um, because they, it helps them so much. And so for the indications, trigger points that are symptomatic, contraindications, We've pretty much uh, exhausted these uh, in the other procedures that we've seen. Uh, afterwards, these patients can have you know, syncope. They can break the needle because we're actually injecting into the muscle itself. Uh, if you go too deep, you can cause a pneumothorax. Hopefully, you're not going too deep like that. You should know what you're doing if you're doing this in the, in the clinic. Uh, following... Uh, you'll tell the patient that it might be a, a little bit better and then it might get a little worse before it gets better again. And uh, just really telling your patient what to expect is most uh, helpful. So you're going to take your two fingers and your non-dominant hand. 
Are you going to get the patient in a comfortable position? And you're going to find that trigger point. You're going to keep it between your two fingers, that point of maximal uh, pain and that little uh, balling of the muscle. You're going to keep it between your two fingers. And then we'll, you're going to clean the area, get a needle, uh, get your syringe filled with either your lidocaine or your lidocaine and steroid. And you're going to insert the needle into the trigger point about in 30 degree angle, withdraw the plunger, and then uh, inject. And when you inject, you'll kind of repeat um, kind of fanning in and out along that injection. And that helps distribute the medication all within that subcutaneous tissue and muscle fibers. Um, after you're done, then you can remove your fingers because you want to keep that trigger point within your fingers at all times. Uh, and then you'll apply some pressure uh, to stop the bleeding and then a bandage. So we're done. That was a little longer than I wanted, but the good thing is now that you've made it through this lecture outside of class, when we get into class, we can just hit the high points. We don't have to re redo the whole thing all over again. And we can focus more on how can I test you on this, um, things to expect with your patients and, uh, you know, how to be the best, uh, hands-on clinicians that you can be. So if you have any questions after watching this, just feel free to reach out to me and I'll get back to you. If not, I will see you in class. Thank you.